He was right here, right next to the king. The king threw his prisoners in there. When I imagine it was kind of like a country club type jail, you know, like what they have. It wasn't like a dungeon. You know, these were the king's prisoners. So let's pick up um, one, three, four. But I want you to I want you to know something tonight <coughs> that Joseph is climbing this ladder, and every single trial that he's going through, he's being qualified to rule and reign as a second in command. So let's read uh, verses one through four. It says then it came about after these things, the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt offended their lord, the king of Egypt. Pharaoh was furious with his two officials, the chief cupbearer and the chief baker. So he put them in confinement in the house of the captain of the bodyguard in the jail, the same place where Joseph was in prison. The captain of the bodyguard put Joseph in charge of them, and he took care of them, and they were in confinement for some time. So what you're going to see tonight is a lot of similarities with Jesus. A lot of I teach, uh, from Bible study, I teach types and shadows. And so I want to show you how this is, is, when I show you the types and shadows, it helps you to apply it to your life. Because otherwise, this is just a story of Joseph, right? Okay. So the cupbearer and the baker, let's just call them, they were transgressors, right? They upset Pharaoh. Whatever they did, they upset him. So they transgressed against Pharaoh as far as he's concerned. Right? Well, Isaiah 53 says that Jesus was numbered with the transgressors. Verse 12. Yet he himself bore the sin of many and interceded for the transgressors. See, these guys were sentenced to die. They were sentenced to die unless something intervened. They were both on the path of death. And, and Jesus, didn't he also have two what were they? They were thieves. He had two criminals beside him on the cross. This is a type of shadow. You're seeing a picture of Jesus. Joseph is, we can take Joseph and we can just squeeze him and Jesus just pours out of him. Remember I told you there's only two guys in the Bible where no sin is, is charged their way. One's Daniel and one's Joseph. Joseph did not, I'm not saying he didn't sin. I'm saying the Bible did not record it. The only one that's ever not sinned was Jesus. But this is showing you a type and shadow of Jesus. So what happened was, he was numbered with the transgressors. Joseph was numbered with the transgressors, and so was Jesus. Now, if we look at Luke 23, 39... Luke 23, 39. It says, One of the criminals who were hanged there was hurling abuse at him, saying, Are you not the Christ? Save yourself and us. But the other answered and rebuking him said, Do you not even fear God since you are under the same sentence of condemnation? And we indeed are suffering justly, for we are receiving what we deserve for our deeds. But this man has done nothing wrong. And he was saying, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Okay, so um, this is the same thing. This is the same type of story. You've got a baker and you've got a cupbearer. You've got one thief that's going to go into damnation. He's going to go to hell if he doesn't get saved. And you've got another thief that's going to go into salvation. So we're going to see the cupbearer and the baker. Things are going to happen the same way for them. But I want you to know, I said it Saturday night, I want you to see it here too. Dreams were very, very important to earlier generations because they knew that God was speaking to them. It was very, very important. So let's pick up 5 through 15. Then the cupbearer and the baker for the king of Egypt, who were confined in jail, both had a dream the same night. Each man with his own dream, and each dream with his own interpretation. When Joseph came to them in the morning and observed them, behold, they were dejected. He asked Pharaoh's officials who were with him to find them in his master's house. Why are your faces so sad today? Then they said to him, We have had a dream, and there is no one to interpret it. Then Joseph said to them, Do not interpretations belong to the Lord? Tell it to me, please. 
So the chief cupbearer told the stream to Joseph and said to him, In my dream, behold, there was a vine in front of me. And on the vine were three branches. And as it was budding, its blossoms came out, and its clusters produced ripe grapes. Now Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, so I took the grapes and squeezed them into Pharaoh's cup. And I put the cup into Pharaoh's hand. Then Joseph said to him, This is the interpretation of it. The three branches are three days. Within three more days, Pharaoh will lift up your head and restore you to your office, and you will put Pharaoh's cup into his hand, according to your former custom when you were his cupbearer. Only keep me in mind that it goes well with you, and please do me a kindness by mentioning me to Pharaoh and get me out of this house. For I was kidnapped from the land of the Hebrews, and even here I have done nothing that they should have put me into the dungeon. Now, what did it say? It said that, um, over here, it said that they had been, in verse 4, they were in confinement for some time. So now they've had a dream, and it's just going to be three more days, right? Okay, so the three branches, so you've got this vine, and you've got three branches, and you've got, um, the three branches were budding, and the blossoms came out in clusters of ripe, ripe grapes. And he squeezed those grapes and poured it into Pharaoh's cup. What you need to know is that the cupbearer was not a servant position. It was actually a friend position. It was not like a waiter. So he was, a, he was his closest advisor. You know, back then, they were, everybody was trying to kill the king. They would poison them and all that. So this guy would actually drink his cup before he would to make sure it wasn't being poisoned. Them. So this guy was his friend. He wasn't a servant position. Um, and, and what would happen is, is in three days, it was going to be restoration for the cupbearer. Well, what I want you to see is in what we just read, in um, verses uh, 11, I think it was, through 15, the word cup is mentioned four times. The word cup is mentioned four times. Everything is significant in the Bible. Always remember that. The days are significant, the words, the letters. If there's anything that I teach you ever, it's going to be that everything means something. Okay? So I want to teach you, I don't know if you, you're aware of it, but this is actually a Jewish um, custom. When they get married, when the Jews get married, they drink four cups. Are you familiar? Anybody know about the Jewish wedding? I'm just going to tell you a little piece of it. you remember when I taught it earlier? Okay. Well, the four cups, it says four, it says cup four times, and that means something. That's a type of shadow. There's all these little hidden mysteries that we want to find, and I don't want to miss this one. All right. The four cups are four covenants. These things represent a lot of things. So the first cup is sanctification. When you got saved, Okay? You agreed to marry a, a bridegroom, right? We're marrying a bridegroom. We're a bride. So sanctification is the salvation, it's the servant covenant, it's also the blood covenant. When you get saved, you've got a blood covenant with your bridegroom. Okay? What happens is, is each family, when they go to the house and they're getting married, the bride and the groom are getting married, the family of the bride, the family of the groom, each family agrees to serve the other family. That's why you don't hear many Jewish people getting divorced. Because the families got married. That's a strong bond. Not just, I don't think I love him anymore. Well, that's too bad. My family's married to his family. But in this sanctification, it means to be set apart for God. You're agreeing to set yourself apart. No more. Nobody can marry you. You've agreed to marry one man, and that's Jesus. And you're going to become one. This is also the deliverance um, covenant, and it ushers in the Sabbath day. Now, the Sabbath day, whenever you see it in the Bible, yes, it does mean the Sabbath day and all that, but it means rest. When you enter into rest, Ephesians 4 talks about working diligently to enter into rest. Let me give you a little word picture of that. Let's say that you're trying to get your car to start, and you can't get it to start, so you're going to have to push it. So you get behind it, and you push with all your might. You push, and you push, and you push, and somehow you get that thing rolling. 
and you push and push and push and 